Tonight, the University of Texas presents John Paul DeJoria, co-founder of John Paul Mitchell Hair Systems. DeJoria will speak to students in the UT College of Natural Sciences about his experiences as an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and environmentalist. DeJoria's talk documents his remarkable rags to riches story. Rising from humble beginnings, DeJoria leveraged a $700 loan into one of the most innovative business models in the beauty industry. Building on his success, he co-founded the popular Patron Spirits Company in 1989. In addition to being a passionate advocate for the environment, DeJoria has also contributed substantially to the fields of healthcare, social services, and awareness in the arts. I'd like to start out very important and poignant meetings with the one phrase that I love to quote. You see something and you think it's real. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. But what is very real is that not only in business, but in a nation, we the people can change the nation. I'm going to talk to you about a few things today. I think the thing that will be the most important to many of you here that are undergraduates or graduate students is how can you start a business with little to no money and become successful at it? And at the same time, give you some examples of the end result and what you could do to change the planet along the way. I received a phone call several weeks ago from the managing director of Goldman Sachs. And it went like, John Paul, I never thought in a lifetime I would ever see this headline. Patron tequila that only sells ultra premium high end tequila just surpassed Jose Cuervo in retail dollars, has the largest tequila company in the world in retail dollars. I thought, wow, far out, come a long ways here. But it wasn't that way 32 years ago. So I'm going to turn the time clock back a little bit and tell you to what you do when you start out, what it takes to make it, and along the way, some of the various things you have to overcome. I'll start out and I'll repeat it a few times to you here throughout the evening. There are two things I suggest to people to know to become successful. The first thing is be ready for rejection. You're going to get a lot of it. If you're ready for rejection, and you know that, no matter how many times you experience rejection, it's not going to affect you. Be ready for rejection. A lot of people in life, it's not a good idea, don't like what you're doing, go do this, go do that. Be prepared for rejection and get a lot of it. When you're prepared for it, it's not going to phase you. Second of all, successful people do all the things unsuccessful people don't want to do, like knocking on 50 doors that are slammed in your face. And on door number 51, be just as enthusiastic, just as confident as you were on door number one, which goes back to the original one. Be prepared for a lot of rejection. Those are two real secrets. Work all week long. Work on the weekends. If things are down, don't depend on others to get you out. Get yourself out because that's why we are here on this planet. The frequency is rising and more and more we have the ability to do this. About 32 years ago, a dear friend of mine who was a hairdresser, his name was Paul Mitchell. Actually, it was Cyril Thomas Mitchell. He picked Paul Mitchell as his hairdressing name. And one me, John Paul, who was in marketing sales, decided to get together to start a hair care company. Now, because he was a hairdresser, we used the name he picked as his hairdresser name, Paul Mitchell, as the name of our products. Because we chose to only sell our products to professional beauty salons. That's why we still see many of our commercials. If you ever see a Paul Mitchell product in any drugstore or supermarket, it's either counterfeit or the black gray market or extremely old. We don't put it there. We were true to what we wanted to do. 
Well, being really sharp people in 1980, we thought we have it made. Paul, you'll own 30% of the company. We'll call it Paul Mitchell after a hairdresser's name, and I'll own 30%, and uh, we'll be partners, and we'll give 40% to the person that's coming up with $500,000. We need $500,000 in 1980 to start a professional hair care company to become successful. We're all excited. My relationship wasn't going that good. Wanted to get out of it anyways, so I left my ex-wife with whatever money I had, uh, the best car that I had, a couple hundred bucks in my pocket, and I'm going down the hill to get this, the hill to get this half million dollars from the bank, check in a hotel for a week or two, and get an efficiency apartment. So I'm all excited. I get in my car, I go down the hill, go to the bank, no money, nothing. Found out later that evening after making phone calls anywhere and everywhere, and we didn't have cell phones in that time. So we looked everywhere for telephones to call off of. There were no cell phones in those days. Anyways, we found out later that evening that the backer pulled out. Never sent us a dime. Why did he pull out? He pulled out because inflation in the United States in 1980 was 10 and a half, I'm sorry, 12 and a half percent. Inflation in 1980 and 81 was 12.5%. Unemployment in 1980 and 81 was 10.5% constant. Interest rates in the United States of America in 1980 and 81 were 18% if you wanted to get a loan, if you could even get a loan. And for gasoline, you had to wait in line around the block to get gasoline. Now, is this a time to start a business with little to no money? Are we today in worse times than we've ever been before? Worse since the Great Depression? Uh uh. That's politicians and that's the press. That is not fact. So, how do you start a business with no money under the worst conditions that your backer doesn't want to give you a dime? What do you do? Get ready for a lot of rejection and at the same exact time, do the things others don't want to do. Do what's necessary, do what it takes, no matter what it is, and try not to hurt anybody along the way. How do we do it? How the world do you do it? Let me give you how we did it. First of all, we needed an office. I didn't even have a home. Got an answering machine, at that time it was $49.95 for an answering machine. Today it's $20 for an answering machine. Got a friend's phone, put the answering machine on there. I did not go on the answering machine. This British lady that I knew got on the answering machine and said, oh, hello, John Paul Mitchell Systems International. How can I be of help to you? We're all out working now, we'll get back to you later. A different voice, we seem bigger. It was only my partner and I. My partner was not a businessman, he was a hairdresser. So he did beauty shows, he was a darn good hairdresser, one of the best there were. Real good trainer, good educator. I did everything else, two guys. So all of a sudden, the answer machine made it sound like there was more than two and we could pick up messages. How about an address? Her address was PO Box 10597. In other words, I went to the post office and for $15 in those days, maybe it's $30 now, I don't know what it is, but it was $15 in those days, I, bought, I got a P.O. box. I rented a P.O. box. For another $3, I was able to go to a printer. Today you have, my gosh, all these printing plates with computers. But for me, it cost me $3 to get a printer to typeset on one piece of paper, John Paul Mitchell Systems, our address, and the phone number we were using. Took that $3 piece of paper, went to a photocopy place for four cents each, and made a whole bunch of photocopies. I now had stationery and an envelope. If I wanted an invoice, I drew lines in it, and I hand wrote my invoice. We started with only three products. A shampoo for normal to fine hair, a shampoo for normal to chemically treated hair or very thick hair, and one product called the conditioner that you would leave in your hair. That's what we started with. They were unique. The shampoos you only had to use one time. That was the quality, one time, not twice. Saves you time and money. It was a little niche, something different. The conditioner, you left it in your hair. 
It saved 10 minutes at the back basin, waiting for the conditioner, and then they rinsed out of the hair. We sold the hairdressers. Later, we invented some called sculpting lotion. So now we had the idea in mind because we were building this company. So we had people we worked with, and they were ready for 100,000 of this, 100,000 of that, 100,000 of this to start our business. We had no money. 700 bucks. My friend Paul came over from Hawaii, wanted to get some of the money too, didn't come in. He was a little older than I was. Said, Paul, how much money do you have that can you spare now? He said, JP, I'm on my last dollars right now. I don't have a lot. I have this little salon in, in Hawaii on the upper floor, single chair. I see people twice a week. It's not the same anymore. What can you spare, Paul? $350. Fine. I had a few hundred dollars in my pocket. But I had to start a company. So I borrowed $350 from my mom. I didn't tell her I'd left my wife and family, left them everything. I was down and out. I just said, Mom, I need a quick $350. bucks. i will pay you back. I'm starting a new business. Here you go, son. I was too proud to say, Mom, I'm on the street. Can I stay in my old bedroom again? Of course, she said, yes, she'd feed me everything. A nice, wonderful mom. I was too proud. So we had $700. Where was my house? My house was the backseat of my car for the first couple of weeks. Backseat of the car. How do you start a business? How do you get product? Well, we were set up in advance for 100000 of everything, but had no money. And we talked to our suppliers and said, hey, we'd like 100000 Here's what we're doing. We'd like 30-day billing. We've got this experience in the beauty industry. I've been in sales and marketing. My partner's a great hairdresser, et cetera, et cetera. He did great shows before in the United States. They were behind us, but we had no money. Before we could start this business, we had to have the artwork. We went to our artist who did the artwork. And it was in black and white. He was ready to add color to it. We said, no, don't add color. Because to silk screen a bottle in black and white is two cents. To silk screen the bottle with color on it was seven cents. Black and white, well, it was a good mistake, very good mistake, because it became unisex without us even realizing what we were doing. So we said, let's tell them the truth. Hey, we have only $700. That's it to start this company. You want $1,000 for the first pieces of artwork here so we could take you to the silk screener to make the screens. He's, I said, so can we give you 200 now and pay you later? He goes, nope. He says, you want this artwork? I want all $700. It's probably all I'll ever see. Our money was gone. How do you start a business? I called up the bottle maker who we were going to buy 100,000 bottles from, and I said, excuse me, but we want a sample run right now, just a small sample run of just 10,000 bottles. Uh, oh, sure, of course. I said, can we have the same pricing as 100,000? Oh, sure, of course. It's a sample run. We called up the silk screener. We're having, well, I'm bringing over the art personally to you. Not, I'm bringing it over personally because I can't afford to have anyone delivered. I'm bringing it over to you personally. By the way, we're only going to do a sample run of 10,000 bottles. 3,000 shampoo one, 3,000 shampoo two, and 6,000 of the conditioner. I'm sorry, 4,000 of the conditioner. Oh, fine, we'll do it for you. I went to my filler. Hey, we're going to do a sample run, same thing, no problem. From the time I ordered the bottles till the time they were silk screened, delivered, and we had something ready to sell, I had two weeks left before the first bill was due. The person that knows more about your service or your product is yourself, nobody else. So I got the products. I put them in the back of my car. My partner had some to go over to Hawaii with them. And I went up Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles, knocking door to door, beauty salon to beauty salon, telling them all about my product and why it was so unique. Most said, you're unheard of. We don't know who you are. We have all these other big companies. Why do we need your product? It was a lot of no's. But in there, I found a yes or two. When I found a yes, I sold them the product. They wrote me a check. I put the check in my pocket. 
When I got to 12 people, which took me several days to get 12 people to buy my product, it was tough. And I'm living out of the back of my car on $2.50 a day. 99 cents breakfast for truckers at the Freeway Cafe. If you have breakfast after 9 o'clock and before 10 o'clock, you got one egg, one sausage, piece of bacon, one of the two, you only had a choice of one of the two, coffee or glass of orange juice and a piece of toast and some hash browns for 99 cents because hardly anyone wanted breakfast from 9 to 10 o'clock. That was breakfast. You eat everything. You're kind of full. Later on during the day, you get really hungry. Well, you don't have any money for lunch. However, how do you eat for a dollar and a quarter that you have left? In many of the chain restaurants, this one was called El Torito. They had happy hour to get people in there from 4.30 to 6 o'clock at night to just come in there. 99 cent margarita. Now, it wasn't the best margarita because they didn't have Patron in those days, but it was a 99 cent margarita. But they gave you, at no charge, little miniature tacos, little salsa, a little chicken wings occasionally. 20 chicken wings later and two bowls of salsa, you've got your veggies in, you've got your protein, and you got a margarita. And I would give her a quarter tip. I was a big spender. That's how I existed. Places like this exist today. You go in there. Now, after a while, I had a little boy at the time that a dear friend of mine helped me take care of after a while there. But with my son, they said after a while, are you down and out in something? Because you're here every single day. You eat all the salsa, every chicken wing in sight like you guys are starved. I said, yeah, things are tough now. We're trying to start a business. All of a sudden, enchilada would show up here. A little guacamole would show up there. They were sweet, wonderful people. In other words, as you're going, you do what you have to do. So here we have the product. I'm knocking door to door. I have no distributor that wants my product. Knocking door to door. And not enough money to pay the first bill that's now due in a matter of a week and a half. Freaking out here. So I take the orders and the checks that are still in my pocket, never went to the bank, and I went to a distributor in Los Angeles, Paris Ace Beauty Supply. I said, Mr. Henrietta, who ran it, John Paul DiGioia, I want to tell you about a new product line I have in case you would like to be the exclusive distributor in Los Angeles. Well, let me hear about it. I told him about the best shampoo we had. That was for normal to color treated hair. The other one that was for normal to thick and oily and greasy hair. And how you only needed one instead of two. It helped salons. It helped the customers save money and time. And how we had a conditioner you would leave in your hair, it would be a moisture treatment, a protein treatment, it would uh, defend against blow dryers damaging your hair, how it was revolutionary, and how he should be my distributor, and if he was, I would work with the salespeople uh, to sell my product and make sure it sold through and show them how to sell it. He looked at me and said, young man. Why in the world would I want to buy a new product from you when I have all these big lines, the Redkins, the Matrix, the L'Oreal's, he went on and on and on and on. Why would I want your line? You're brand new, you're a startup, and you're not even proven yet. I reached in my pocket, pulled out 12 checks and laid them in front of him. I said, sir, that's your first 12 customers. I just got them for you. Hesitated, looked him in the eye, he goes, really? Looked at the checks, he recognized some of the salons that wrote it. He goes, really? He said, yes, those are your checks. If you will just order $2,000, we were pretty desperate, you could have the exclusivity on all of Los Angeles and Orange County. And he laughed and said, he says, you know what? He says, I'll do it. Uh, I said, but sir, there's one thing I'd like to ask you, please. We're brand new starting out. Can you please do me a favor? When the product is delivered, can you please give us a check? And I'll give you a 5% discount on the spot if you give us a check on the spot. He said, we're Paris Ace Beauty Supply. We pay our bills in 45 days, not immediately or not COD. I said, sir, you'll get an extra 5% discount if you will do this. He goes, okay, he laughed and said, I says, I'll do it this one time, but you better be here to sell it with my people. Unbeknownst to him, the product was in the back of my car. I drove around back to the warehouse. The warehouse manager, because we brought him to our 20-year anniversary, by the way, Jim Henrietta, he told the story. He says, within a matter of two minutes, my warehouse guy is calling and says, there's some guy named John Paul here and says, I need a check for $2,000. He just made a delivery. Jim Henrietta came out laughing his head out, handed me a $2,000 check. And that's how we're able to barely pay our first bill a little bit late. Now, 
How did I come up with that extra 5%? I knew we had no money. I knew my industry, and maybe the industry you're going into, is used to paying their bills in 30, 45, or 60 days. How do you do it? You build up your price, and you add 5% onto your wholesale cost, knowing you're going to give that away anyways to try and get your checks right away. That's how we got money right away. We changed the professional beauty industry because today, even my big distributors today pay their bills within 10 days, not 45 days, not 60 days. We started a trend but gave a person a reason to do it. When you start businesses, you want to start a business where whatever it takes, you'll keep on doing it until you actually get it done. Successful people doing all the things the unsuccessful people don't want to do. And this is a proven course of action. When we started Patron Tequila in 1989, the United States of America and most of the world knew tequila as something you drank in high school or college, and you weren't supposed to drink it, but you did because you thought you were cool, and you got drunk, and you got sick as can be that night and the next day and swore you'd never do it again. You had to hold your breath. The average tequila in 1980 sold for about $6 a bottle. The cheaper ones for $2, the expensive ones for $15 a bottle in 1980. When we made Patron tequila, we made it out of the finest Highlander Weber Blue Agave. That was maybe a little better for you perhaps than regular tequila or agave. We processed it the old fashioned way which took forever. But we had to sell it in stores for $37 a bottle, $35 discounted when we started in 1989. Our distributor said, guys, you'll never succeed. I don't care what you do with the quality, you're not going to succeed. You're talking about many times the price of any tequila ever to come out. But we believe that America and the world was ready to treat themselves to something special. And when you're ready to treat yourself to something special, when you're ready to treat yourself to something good, you realize it's okay, and you slowly want to move into it, you find ways to do it. So how do we launch this product when nobody wanted it? First of all, my partner and I went knocking door to door, the same way I started John Paul Mitchell Systems. I went to my friend Wolfgang Puck at Spago's. I said, Wolfgang, here's this new tequila we came out with, taste it. Wolf said, God, JP, that's really good. Wolfgang, would you mind turning on all of your celebrity clientele, the Bruce Springsteen's and everybody else, to this great tequila? Little did we know that he would not go on tour unless he had a case with him once he got turned on to it, like many other people. We went to Ba Cantina. My friend Martin went to Ba Cantina and said, hey, guys, taste this. Would you carry it for us? And then we went door to door. In California, you could do this from one cafe, one restaurant, one bar to another and said, we want to buy you a shot of tequila. Sure, they could do it there. Three dollars, they poured themselves whatever the best stuff was they had that maybe wasn't the best and said, thank you very much, took our three dollars. We said, now would you mind bringing out a shot glass? We want you to try something. They brought out a shot glass. We poured Patron in there. We said, now taste this. Wow, what's this? This is the future of tequila. This is Patron. One day people will order this by the name Patron because it's so good. It's made out of the finest Highlander agave ever made. We only pick the best and we don't substitute like others do. It's only made out of the slow process and always will be made that way. At Paul Mitchell, we said, we will always sell the professional hairdressers. We'll always have the best hair care products for you. We never broke our promise. At Patron, we said, one day this will be the way. We'll always make it the same way. Small stills, not the big ones when you get bigger. It'll always be the same quality. Door to door to door. A distributor would not take us on. So we thought out of the box. We didn't go to an alcohol distributor. We went to a wine distributor. Wine warehouse in Southern California never handled a spirit in their life. And we said, if you'll carry our product line, we'll go out there and sell it with you door to door with your salespeople and get it done. And that's kind of how we started the company. 
both companies as they grew, we took on partners, we took on distributors, and they were small to begin with, and as we grew, they became larger and larger and larger. We all grew together, many starting with very, very little, and all of a sudden ending up with a whole bunch later on. But it was all the attitude of, let us start something because we believe in it. When you start a business, whether it's technologically inclined, whether it's materialistically inclined, whether you have a tangible item, or an idea or a thought, or something dealing with today's technology that you can't physically see, you must program it in. Don't ever go into business to sell anything. The minute you go into business to start selling something is the minute you went into business to do whatever's necessary just to get your product sold. What can I do for me now? Now it's like a politician. I'll do this, I'll do that, get me elected. We elect him, and no disrespect to our politicians all over the world, no matter what branch they may be in, they don't do it. Sometimes they mean well, but they lie to you to get elected, and they don't do it. All of a sudden, you start losing credibility. When you tell somebody something, you gotta do it. Always give somebody the best possible product you can, and don't sell it to them. Go into business to be in the reorder business, not the selling business. It changes your mindset, it changes what you do, it changes what you say, it changes exaggerations, you gotta be a little closer to the truth on what you're doing, because you don't wanna sell something. You want your product to be so good that either that person reorders it or tells a friend of its quality and its appreciation that they want to go order what their friend did. Go into business to be in the reorder business, not to be in the order business. Everything changes. You're doing things now for the future. I don't work any longer. It's not because I make more than 100 bucks a day. It's because I love what I do. I love what I do. I don't consider what I do work. I have not considered it for 32 years ever since I went to work for myself. I never considered it work. I, it was hard at times. I consider it doing what I want to do. Now, there's many times where I'm working from morning till night. You'll call it work. To me, I'm loving what I'm doing. I'm having a blast. And I'm changing the world along the way. We all enter a planet. And we enter this planet with absolutely nothing. We have no clothes on. We just enter. Now, depending on how you're brought up, you're fed different ways. But hopefully, you're in college now. You were fed. And I know you had a meal before you came down here that the university gave you. So you're fed one way or another. Most people on this planet want to do something and leave their mark. A lot of people say, well, I'll raise these riches, and when I die, a university or a temple or someone will be named after me. In the meantime, I'll, I'll create some of my wealth, and by gosh, I'll share it with education. I'll share it with other philanthropic endeavors. And that's a good thing to do. When you do a business, always have in mind that success unshared is total failure. When you start a business, you don't have a lot of money to make contributions financially to very good causes, but you could dedicate a little bit of time. I was speaking with Alex backstage, and he told me that the majority of you are thinking about maybe being entrepreneurs, or should you be an entrepreneur? JP, can you tell them how you started a couple of companies, even the bigger ones, with little to no money, and why you did the same thing when the bigger companies came around? You know, can you tell? I said, sure. He says, what else can you tell them so that they could get encouraged to be entrepreneurs and in business? I said, well, the best thing I could probably share with you is something that we started about seven months ago for entrepreneurs. When an entrepreneur gets going, they usually have no money for warehousing, no money for shipping, let alone how do you get enough money for a credit card to accept a credit card over the telephone, and then how do you ship something to somebody in inventory warehousing it? If you have no money, how do you do it? So we started several months ago, and go online and find it. It's called jpselects.com. 
jpselects.com. I'm the JP in jpselects.com. jpselects.com was put together to give entrepreneurs a helping hand. jpselects.com is a site you go to where it has different categories, purses, shoes, electronics, ideas, uh, an album, just all kinds of various things are on there. To get on there, there are a couple requirements. One, you must do something sustainable in the manufacturing of your product or your service. You must, or you're not on there. Help the world become a better place to live. Second of all, your business or yourself personally must contribute to something to change the world for the better, philanthropically. You may not have money, but you volunteer to clean up a beach. You go to an old folks home and, and sing to them or talk to them or bring them flowers or just sit and chat with them. You do something, something you or your staff must do. And at the same time, no slave labor. It's got to be something where everybody benefits. Then you could qualify for JP Selects. We had one of the biggest water companies in the world come to us when they heard about it and said, oh, we want to be on JP Selects. And they did everything right. They took care of their local people on their island when they made their water. They did, we were philanthropic. They did all kinds of good things. But we had to turn them down because don't want to mention any names, but let's just say they made millions of bottles that were plastic that weren't biodegradable. And they didn't encourage people to recycle them. Well, we would build that big ocean of plastic in the middle Pacific Ocean bigger. So we had to turn them down. But yet on the other hand, we accepted Angie McCartney. That's Paul McCartney's mom with McCartney tea. She had good organic natural tea, so we accepted her. It was that type of thing that we wanted. More recently, friends of ours in the music industry, uh, like, uh, oh God, James Taylor, Snoop Dogg, Stevie Wonder, and several others, wanted to put some of their albums on JP Selects. And well, how can we be sustainable, JP? We all contribute our music, our time to philanthropic ventures, but how do we get our product on there? I said, simple, take the plastic jacket off the CD or the DVD and throw it away, cost you money anyways. Package it in recycled cardboard or paper. The customer's not gonna mind one bit. They're gonna take it out anyways. And they're gonna love to have something that's sustainable for the planet, bingo. So over the next month, we're now getting them on jpselects.com. We finally figured out a way to do it in the last few weeks. Why jpselects.com? You're not a producer, you have no money. jpselects.com will warehouse for you. They'll warehouse for you. They will promote for you through the website. They will let you do a 90 second public service announcement on your product, why it's so good, why it's great, why people should get it from you. They will sell it to the customer. They will collect the money on the spot on credit cards from the customer and do all the administration and every single month sends you a check for 70% of retail. For those that have never been in business, it's unheard of. The biggest corporation in the world can't get 70% of retail. You buy something from a store or a market, and of course the store market's gotta make their percentage, their 33, 40%, whatever. Then the distributor's gotta make their 20%. Then it's all the way down the line, the trucking company, and if you end up with 30 or 35% of retail, boy, are you a big successful company. I mean, that's a, the giants may do that. 70% of retail goes in your pocket. The other 30% that's left, part of it goes to the charities that we at the Peace, Love, and Happiness Foundation, which is my family foundation, we select as a charity for that money to go to. The other 25 that's left goes to warehousing, shipping, handling, collecting the money. If there's anything left at the end of the year, the partners could split it up. There's nothing left at the end of the year. It's pretty well used up, obviously. But it's a way where people say, oh my gosh, now I have something to go to. Because I know what it was like for me when I had no warehouse. I had no shipping. I was it. I had to drive it around and drop it off until I got my first distributor. It was very, very difficult. It's ways to help people. Now, underway, I want to give you an example and take a couple moments, because I do have a few moments left here, to tell you the power you have. Everyone in this room is probably a little bit more aware than any of the previous students that were here 20 years ago. As I look at people around me, even my own kids, each generation is getting smarter. 
They're getting smarter because the frequency of this planet is now rising. The frequency is rising and it's measurable. Today, more people are into philanthropic endeavors than ever before in the history of our planet. Now, you may say, JP, that's great, but we have six billion people. This is per capita, not population, per capita the population. Something's going on. People are protesting saying, government, hey, Mr. President, no disrespect to the president, okay? When you ran for election, you promised us this, 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 and this. And one of them wasn't one of them like Mr. President, no disrespect, but no more lobbyist, no, no more uh, pork bill or spending and all the bills you'd veto everyone. Well, Mr. President, you never did that. What went wrong? President before him, President Bush. President Bush, you said you do this and, and you did it. With all due respect, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they're politicians. They work in a polit political arena. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to change this, okay? And you will change it because you're the generation that's going to do it. Several months ago, genius idea. Let's take six Republicans, six Democrats, put them in a closed room, and guys, in one week, you come out of that room and you tell us how to knock off $1 trillion, $200 billion off our deficit in the next 10 years. Come out with the answer. First of all, you've got to be kidding. That's $100 billion a year? That's nothing. They came out a week later. You know the answer they came up with? We don't know. Of course they don't know. They're politicians. I researched every single person on that panel, Republicans and Democrats, so this is bipartisan, this statement. Not one of them ever ran a business in their life. And only one of them had a father that ran a business years before. Only one had a father. Of course they can't come up with the answer. Also, aren't they answering questions that because of, no disrespect once again, okay, I love the unions, I love free enterprise, I'm a capitalist, and I love people. But aren't you now coming up with ways to take money away from all those you promised that they will give you money to get reelected, you would support them all the way? Of course you came up with no answer. Well, fine, as one of the news stations asked me, CNN, JP, what's the answer? It's very simple. It's we the people. Put in the, and by the way, it's behind closed doors, no cameras. Put a glass room together with cameras in it so the whole United States of America can see it. Put a few politicians and only a few and fill that room with entrepreneurs and businessmen that started with nothing and make something happen or had something and took over a business and created jobs and lowered, <coughs> lowered what it cost to do it. Yeah, but isn't corporate America the bad guy now? Are you kidding? When things went wrong in 2080, corporate America looked at how do we survive? How do we create jobs that aren't going to be taken away in the future? They started taking the fat out of their business. Now, it cost a few jobs, granted. They took fat out. But now, they're so healthy that they're looking now to hire more people. And you want to know what the biggest problem in some of these businesses? No one's qualified to fill the jobs. They don't have the sciences, they don't have the mathematics. It's amazing. They're not qualified. There's jobs there. They're not qualified. A lot of people in the workforce don't even have a high school education. We the people can change it. So you put in that room these people, and we don't do a trillion, 200 billion. We do $5 trillion. We have a deficit now, 15 trillion. You tell us, how do we over 10 years get rid of $5 trillion? And I assure you, in less than a week, we're gonna come up with the answer. And it's gonna be a good one. And it's one that's gonna be long reaching. We keep forgetting it's we the people that make things change. It's we the people that make things happen. There's a lot of poverty going on right now. Take a guess in your own mind. We had this exercise a little bit earlier. What do you think the federal government spends on food stamps? And by the way, there's 51 million American families on food stamps right now, 51 million. What do you think the government spends per family? I'm just gonna throw a figure out, $50 a month. Could anybody here live for $50 a month with a family off groceries? Eh, maybe more than that. Maybe more than that. We the people answer things. And here's people doing nothing, sitting collecting food stamps. 
I'll give you one example, the Appalachian Mountains, a forgotten area in the United States. Kentucky, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, wonderful hardworking people. Many of them are second and third generation coal miners, out of work. These big companies like Massey Coal come in, remove mountaintops, and God knows how they get away with that, but they do. They ruin our own environment. And every one of these big machines that remove these mountaintops displaces about 175 people, Bobby told me, Bobby Kennedy Jr. They're out of work. They want to work. They get food stamps. They barely get by. One family said, one week we had $5. We have four kids. We didn't get our unemployment check, our subsidy for another week. Do we spend $1 on the electric bill and $4 on food for, what do we do? What do we the people do? We the people make things happen. We don't wait for the government to do it. You're going to be doing this next, so I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you what you're going to be doing next and how you can do it. We started Grow Appalachia. I asked for no money. My family foundation pays for all of this. We pay for it. Here's what we did. We geared up with Bria College in Kentucky, which was in the Appalachian Mountains. I paid for help. I paid for the seeds, the fertilizer, the irrigation, and the equipment. A hoe, if you have a little garden. If 50 families got together, I'll buy you a tractor. We taught them how to feed themselves. The goal two years ago was we found out there's approximately 150,000 families in the Appalachian Mountains unemployed and on food stamps. I said, great, I'll take half of them. I'll take 75,000 families. Within five to seven years, they're going to be feeding themselves automatically. I'm taking that on as a challenge. We, the people of the United States of America. That's what we, forget the government, we're going to do it. We did it. We went in there. First of all, we found indigenous things to grow, like the snap pea that gives you all the protein you need. All of a sudden, the people in Appalachia, the families we started, were growing everything they needed to eat, and then enough to can for the winter months. They could put some food away. Wow. Then enough to feed those around them that were destitute we could not find out about. They fed themselves. They canned for the winter. They had all the food supply they needed. They helped others out. And it was amazing. The first year, all of a sudden, they got healthier. All of a sudden, when you see a lot of people in Appalachia, maybe a lot of them look like they're a bit overweight, and they are. That's called poverty, not I ate too much. When you don't have any money, I've been there, you buy the cheapest foods, white flour, you buy the cheapest stuff you could possibly buy, and you, you feed yourself. If you're young, it's cool. As a student, you got to do that. But you know, you're young, okay? You get rid of it. But when you're a little older, it's not that hard. They don't buy vegetables. Now, when the body is hungry, it says, feed me. It doesn't say, give me a carrot, give me a, a, an orange. It just says, feed me. Of course, you eat the cheapest foods. All of a sudden, they're growing their own vegetables and eating them because they're proud. They're delicious. They start losing weight without even knowing what they're doing. Between working in the garden and eating their own vegetables, they're starting to lose weight. Two years later, actually a year and a half later, we go and visit one of the sites. Families are already starting, not just to feed themselves, can for the winter, feed those impoverished around them. They're now selling their organic vegetables to farmers markets and grocery stores and creating an agricultural community and an income. We're now looking at giving all of them a rooster and 10 chickens to so have all the eggs they want. And of course, let the hens sit on some of those eggs to have more chickens and roosters to give to your neighbors. Now you have all the eggs you need for an additional way of life. What does this cost to feed a family forever? It's going to cost me less than, less than $100 per family less than $100 per family to feed them for the rest of their lives. We're exactly on target. Within five more years, at least 50% of Appalachia is feeding themselves, those that are employed, and many of them in an agriculture business. It's we the people that make things happen. This new generation that we're in right now, you, you, we the people, not only can start businesses on your own, but could change this planet. Gonna share one last story with you here, and then we'll be open to questions and answers. What are you capable of doing? You're smarter than we were. You're smarter than my generation. But when I started in 1980, I had no money. I was the bookkeeper, the shipper. I did 20 jobs. When I finally could afford one person to hire, I hired a young lady named Shirley Wong. 
I said, Shirley, I need help to get out there and sell more. Shirley, you're the receptionist. You're the bookkeeper. You're the accountant. You are the processor. You are the shipper. She had 12 jobs. Wow, can I do it? Surely you could do it. And she did it. Today, John Paul Mitchell Systems is the largest single line, privately owned professional hair care company in the world. We're in 87 countries. The entire corporation worldwide has some of the greatest distributors and educators you could have ever imagined. But the corporate hub itself, counting the warehouse, not where we manufacture, but counting the warehouse, our executive offices worldwide, has 250 employees. That's it. Patron, and we manufacture our own tequila. Every bottle is hand blown out of recycled glass. We're cleaning up the streets of Mexico. It's a good thing to do. We have about 1,400 employees, and now we're the largest in the world as a, a, a tequila company. But for our size, we should have twice as many employees. We don't. You are capable of doing so much if only you knew it. It's like people that say, hey, I'm only supposed to do this from 8 to 12 and no more. That's what I'm going to do. It's my job. Well, wait a minute. Why can't you do two or three jobs and you'll never lose your job? Why are jobs going from America to other countries? Because instead of 100 people to do a film, for example, they could do it with 50 people in another country. Well, wait a minute. Why can't the American Union say, hey, instead of one guy going click and getting paid, he could go click and plug in the plug. That's two jobs. We don't lose our jobs. America is great. We the people are changing. You are the next generation. And know not only starting your businesses, which you should do and do them very, very well, along the way, you are the masses. And many people jump on a movement when they say the masses are doing it, we want to be part of the masses, but they forget. The masses are made up of individuals. You are your own mass. You can do some really cool changes here. I want to thank you very, very much. And David, I think you want to pop back up here again wherever you may be. Or, or thank you. Cool. I, know, I know many of you have to go study or start a new business, but before, before you head on out, I'd like to ask Katie Hackerman and Alex Mango to come up, please. We have a special gift for you. Oh, cool. Honorary PhD. <laughs> Now that needs the Board of Regents <laughs> approval. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Wow, thank you. That's very nice. Oh, very nice. Why don't we remember all you guys? <laughs>